Oh, it was just what? A little white lie. You ever heard anybody say that? It's just a little white lie. What God hears is that, well, God's standard of righteousness doesn't really apply to me. Because God doesn't shade the truth, does he? It's either a truth or a falsehood. And we are either striving to reveal the truth or conceal the truth, to lie. There is no middle ground in this. Secondly, we sometimes excuse our lies by saying, well, okay, yeah, I lied. But it was for what? For the right reasons. Listen to me carefully. There is no right reason for lying. And if anything cuts to the heart of faith, it's lying rather than trusting in God. Because when we say, I lied, but it was for the right reasons, what God hears is that, well, God, you can't be trusted to work things out if I tell the truth. So it's better that I take matters into my own hands, right? Because quite frankly, I'm a lot better at this than you are. Sounds foolishness when we say it like that, right? How about this one? Well, I didn't really lie. I just didn't what? I just didn't tell the whole truth. There's an old saying that says a half-truth is a whole lie. And what God hears when we say that I didn't really lie because I didn't tell the whole truth is that essentially the truth really doesn't matter to me. It wasn't important for me to reveal the truth in the first place. In fact, it was important to me to what? To conceal the truth and make sure that the truth never came to light. A lie by any other name is still a lie, right? So Jesus says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a what? A murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth, and, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of lies. I know somebody's going to say, well, I can be bilingual. No, you can't. Don't even go there. Now we've been speaking about the, the spiritual consequences of our willingness to deceive, our willingness to, to lie, our willful lack of integrity. But there are also predictable and more immediate consequences for our lack of integrity. Consequences that we don't experience necessarily on Judgment Day, but we experience what? Here and now. I saw a couple of you perk up. Really? Yes, really. Let's take, for example, the, the issue of, of marriage. Christian couples, I'm not talking about people outside the church, I'm talking about Christian couples. We're in the wedding season now, right? May, June, You won't hardly be able to drive through Newburgh because of all the different wedding processions and all that going on. That's great. Love weddings. God loves weddings. What does God hate? God hates divorce. And so it should be alarming when we see that half of the Christian couples who marry this spring, their marriages will end up where? In divorce court. I would offer to you that the vast majority of those divorces, to some degree or another, the reason for their divorce is going to uh, include what? Some type of lie, some type of deception, and ultimately a lack of integrity. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. Very real consequence to our willingness to deceive. How about parenting? Any parents out there today? Anybody who likes to judge other people's parenting? 
Anybody who feels that the next generation is uniformly on the right track, headed in the right direction, I would offer to you, and you can, you can take whatever news source you want, that the evidence suggests that our kids are falling away. And I would offer to you that much of that has to do with a lack of integrity. And this is going to hurt, so brace yourself. I'm not talking about the integrity of the kids. I'm talking about the integrity of what? The parents and the adults in their lives. I'm talking about when parents willingly tell their child something that they know is not true. I'm talking about parents who make commitments to their children that they never intend to keep. I'm talking about our conversations, as brief or as lengthy as they are, that leave our children, after a lifetime of hearing them, wondering what's real and what's false. It's not the kid's fault at this point, is it? At least not entirely their fault. Kids learn this behavior. Then what happens? They become parents themselves, don't they? And guess what? If it worked for good old mom and dad, and on to the next generation and the next. How about in the workplace? I have yet to come across, maybe sometimes people working in, in small businesses and like that feel that the, the workplace is, is uniformly full of integrity and uh, truthfulness. But what I typically see and what I, I generally hear is the story of employers who are constantly looking for ways to stick it to their employees and employees who are consistently looking for ways to what? Stick it to the man. Bosses who are trying to cheat their workers. Workers who spend all day logged on tracking their fantasy football team <laughs> instead of putting in an honest day's work. A lack of integrity on both parts. So we see that, and we could go on and on, couldn't we? We could explore almost any, exam or a, a, any facet of our life, and we would know that our willing lack of integrity is doing what to the world around us? It's bringing it down and down and down. Why are stress levels so high these days? Our ancestors didn't have stress-related disease. Oh, maybe a king or a prince, but not average people. Why now? Because you can't believe anything you hear. You can't trust anything you see. We surround ourselves with people that we're never quite certain if they're telling the truth or not. So it gets to the point to where somebody says, if you're going to quote to me from the Bible, you might as well quote Rowling or Tolkien because they're no more trustworthy than God's Word. It's not the fault of the lost. They haven't been entrusted with the truth. We have. And it's for the salvation of the world that we need to commit ourselves back to that again. You see, because as followers of Jesus, it's not just our own personal integrity that's on the line here, is it? No. It's also the integrity of our Savior. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.10, he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. In other words, Paul understood that the way he lived his life was every bit as important as the words that he shed as he was proclaiming the gospel. And he had to live in a very transparent and honest way or else his, his words would be made 
null and void. I would offer to you that if truth is a language, it's a language that we must learn to speak. It's the language of heaven. And it's time for us to learn to start practicing that language now. And the way we begin to speak the language of truth is first of all, we must commit to love the truth. We must commit up front to love the truth. John chapter 4, Jesus says, A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. We must commit to love the truth up front. Now some of you are maybe not from Missouri, but you at least want to test the goods first. You want to see what it is you're buying into. Show me the truth first, and then I will decide whether I love it or not. And if that is your attitude towards the things of God, guess what? You will never see it with your own eyes. It will always be hidden from you. You must commit to the ways of God first, and then you will be entrusted with the truth. It will be revealed to you and it can begin its work of shaping your life. Opening the, the floodgates of heaven's blessing so that they flow through you and touch the world around you. We must endeavor to love the truth and we must also labor to what? To learn the truth. John 8, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the truth is, the truth is, in actuality, God's people oftentimes seem to prefer ignorance to truth, enslavement to, to freedom. If it has any scientific origin, if it has any source that is the least bit questionable, we put on our blinders and, and we don't want to hear about it. If it in any way would cause me to change the way I live, to shape my thinking or my feeling about the world around me, I don't want to hear it. But you have to understand that if it is true, it is of God. All truth is God's truth. And regardless of whether it is comforting to you or it's that goad in the side that you can't quite get rid of, you need to hear it. You need to learn it and apply it to our lives. And this needs to become a lifelong habit. We never fully comprehend the truth, but it must become a way of living for us as we walk in the truth, day by day, moment by moment. We have to learn to love the truth. We have to labor to learn the truth. And lastly, we must commit to reveal the truth. That's our purpose. That's why we're here, to reveal the truth. And not just with words, but what? With actions. Colossians 3, Scripture says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. Put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Our words and actions will either reveal Christ or reveal Satan into the world of men. We are either proving ourselves to be children of God or what? Children of the deceiver. Children of the liar. Children of the enemy. And the way we prove that is with our integrity. Our commitment to the truth, both when it is easy to tell the truth and when it is profoundly hard.